All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Awesome. All right. So my name is Michaela Weirman, and this summer I interned at Wild Earth Guardians in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I'll be talking to you today about my work that we did to reform wildlife management throughout the state. All right, so a little bit about Wild Earth Guardians. Uh, they were started in Santa Fe, New Mexico 30 years ago. Um, they now have offices all throughout the West. Their mission is to protect and restore the wildlife, wild places, wild rivers, and health of the American West. And so obviously their four program areas are wildlife, wild places, <laughs> wild rivers, and then climate and energy. Um, they have a major focus on litigation, um, but that takes place encompassing all four of their program areas. And so obviously I worked primarily um, under their wildlife department um, with their Southern Rockies wildlife advocate. All right, so uh, they have a lot of different wildlife campaigns going on, um, but their five big ones right now are protecting the Endangered Species Act, which is especially relevant right now, um, defending native carnivores, ending wildlife killing contests, and then the two that I worked primarily on were ending the war on, war on wildlife and ending cruel trapping. Um, I was really lucky to be able to work with Wild Earth Guardians. Um, I knew that I wanted to intern somewhere out west. That's where I grew up. And I also knew that I wanted to work on wildlife issues, especially uh, with carnivores. All right. Uh, so my internship was very multifaceted. Uh, I got to work on a lot of different really fun projects. Um, and some of these included taking photos for Wild Earth Guardians to use in their campaigns, um, creating and updating different inf infographics, uh, attending and preparing for commission meetings, uh, talking at different farmers markets and other events. Uh, one of the big ones I got to do was create and design a map of trapping incidents throughout the state. And then my biggest assignment was researching, designing, and writing a report on the state of trapping in New Mexico. So we'll start off with some of the fun photos I got to take this summer. Um, all of the wildlife photos that you'll get to see were taken using a game camera that I set up at different places in the Santa Fe National Forest throughout the summer. So here we have a striped skunk. Um, got to see a lot, lot, lot of mule deer. <laughs> um, I don't know how well it shows up on here, but this was a black bear. And then my favorite one was this mountain lion, uh, which was really, really <laughs> awesome to get to see. Um, quite a fun surprise. Um, and then I also got to take pictures of public lands throughout the state, which they will be using in campaign materials. So this was taken up near Ghost Ranch. And then I don't actually remember the road that this was on, but it was really quite a pretty day. Um, so in addition, I got to uh, edit, design, and create different fact sheets and other communication tools. Uh, this fact sheet in particular was really exciting. Um, I got to update a lot of it and actually develop and kind of put together it in a whole new way. And this was on cyanide bombs. We started using it the very next week at outreach events um, in order to try to gather signatures to um, or in favor of a national ban on cyanide bombs. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, cyanide bombs are also known as M44s. And they're these little canisters that are filled with cyanide, um, sodium cyanide. They're primarily used by USDA's wildlife services, and they are partially buried in the ground, and they are covered with a bait that's meant to attract canids, primarily coyotes, um, in efforts to prevent depredation. Um, the problem is that these are very attractive to all canids. This can include foxes. This can include family dogs. And between 2010 and 2017, 43 dogs in New Mexico alone were killed with these devices. So they are very indiscriminate, and we're trying to get them off of our landscape. Um, so I was really fortunate to be able to attend a lot of different uh, commission meetings, including two county commission meetings and two game commission meetings during my time there. Uh, this photo was taken right after the first county commission meeting that I attended. It was in Las Cruces, and um, we had teamed up with folks from the Southwest Environmental Center. And uh, we had actually just scored a very minor victory. Um, the county was trying to renew their service or their contract with wildlife services and we had gotten them to amend the contract to require that they attempt two non-lethal management methods before resorting to lethal management of wildlife. So it was very, very exciting. Um, and then these photos were all taken uh, at the, both of those county commission meetings as well. We had made signs for our supporters to hold up throughout the meeting talking that we don't want poisons and we don't want traps on our public lands. And then this woman decided to uh, create her own sign. Um, she was rather upset with Donia Anna County at the time. Um, 
This was taken after the second county commission meeting, um, which was actually a really big disappointment. Following our victory in the first meeting, Wildlife Services essentially decided that they were unwilling to sign the new amended contract, and so they forced them to bring it to a vote again. So they amended our amendment, which basically voided the amendment in the first place and brought it back to the initial contract, and sadly the commissioners sided with Wildlife Services and kind of undid all of our work. But as you can see, we had a lot of great support there, and uh, it was disappointing, but it was great to have such a good show. Uh, one of the exciting things, this was actually at the first county commission meeting, I was able to give public comment, and um, it was really, really helpful to have the MAP program, especially our <laughs> communicating public policy physicians, um, really prepared me well for that, because um, I kind of just did it at a moment's notice, didn't know I was going to be speaking when I showed up that day, um, but worked out really well. Um, so another really fun part of my summer was getting to do outreach and education events. Uh, I got to help table at a lot of different farmers markets and other events. Um, so, you can kind of see here, we had different traps, and so one of the things that I would do was show people how to release a trap in the event that their pet were to get caught in one, or even themselves. We showed people the safest and quickest way to get out of uh, land sets, as well as snares. And then we also just informed people about all the work that we're trying to do to ban traps on public lands throughout the state. Uh, I was also able to manage our social media accounts throughout, my, throughout the summer, um, and especially when we did these tabling events. So these are some of the Instagram stories that I, I created um, for Trap Free New Mexico, which is a coalition that Wild Earth Guardians is a part of. Um, you can see that primarily what we were doing was handing out just a lot of different educational materials, educating people, and um, here's my fact sheet, which is really exciting. Um, and then this is just me with my on-site advisor, Chris. Um, we had a lot of fun tabling at all these events, and it was really great to be able to talk with the public about all of these, these issues. All right, so one of my favorite assignments that I got to do this summer was one that I actually self-initiated, and I compiled a list of trapping uh, incidents all throughout the state, and then used that to build an interactive map that the public can use and it allows them to see where, when, and what types of incidents are happening on New Mexico's public lands. So hopefully this will open for us here. Perfect, okay. So um, this map is soon to be a part of Trap Free New Mexico's official website. Um, so as you can see at the top here, um, the, all of the red incidents are incidents of dogs getting caught in traps. All of the blue are illegal trapping incidents. The yellow are incidents where endangered Mexican gray wolves got caught. And then the green are other trapping incidents. Um, so just to give you an example of a couple of these, um, if you click on any event, it gives you a description of what happened, the date that it happened, and then when available, a photo of what happened. Um, so I have these for many different points um, all around the state, and some of them have more information than others, but, um, so that, that was a very <laughs> involved process, but uh, it's very exciting. The map was put together for Trap New Mexico. This web page will actually be launching on Monday, along with a press release that I got to write. Um, And then uh, the biggest assignment that I did this summer was putting together a comprehensive report on the state of trapping in New Mexico. Um, Wild Earth Guardian's goal is to be able to finish this report in time for the next legislative session, to be able to present it to legislators and media um, for when we reintroduce a bill for the fifth time to try to ban trapping on all public lands throughout the state. Uh, my final paper was based in large part on this report and it was talking about just the negative impacts that trapping has on the state's wildlife and wild places. So this report was very comprehensive. I'll go through just a couple of these points. Um, we wanted to do an overall kind of overview of trapping and place New Mexico in the context of other western states. So for instance, a trapping license in New Mexico only costs $20, and for $20 you can trap an unlimited amount of wildlife. You compare that to the average across all the western states, which is 38.98. It's less than half of, uh, slightly more than half, but about half of what the average license costs. Um, so New Mexico definitely falls short in that respect. 
Uh, New Mexico is one of only two western states that currently allows mountain lions to be trapped, with Texas being the only other state. Uh, New Mexico does not require mandatory trapper education courses before obtaining a license. And unlike Arizona, Colorado, Washington, and California, which recently passed a complete ban on all trapping in the state, uh, New Mexico allows unlimited trapping on all public lands throughout the state for about five to six months out of the year. Uh, we will also include in this report a version of the map that I just showed you to, dem to demonstrate the indiscriminate nature of trapping. One of the more fun parts of the <laughs> report to write was talking about the ecological and health benefits of different commonly trapped species. So I did a lot of research on beavers and how they can really help wildlife thrive and they can help create much healthier ecosystems and that's especially important in very arid, dry climates like New Mexico. Um, got to talk about mesopredators like foxes and coyotes, um, those mid-level predators, um, and how they can really contribute to the complexity of ecosystems and animal life, and they can actually help prevent and control the spread of disease. Um, on the flip side of that, it's also really important to look at the reality of what trapping is. Um, so in our total toll section, we talk about just the sheer number of animals that are actually killed every year. Between 2008 and 2018, at least 132,000 animals were killed in traps in New Mexico. And that's with only 28.6% to 87% of trappers reporting their kills. Uh, last year alone, at least 11,000 animals were killed by trappers. And again, that was with only 81% of trappers reporting. We also have a section on just the inequity of trapping. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are no trapping restrictions or um, reporting regulations for coyotes and skunks. They are deemed non-protected animals, and as such, trappers can, report, or can trap them year-round without a license. Uh, trappers pay no gross receipts tax in order to trap on public lands. And the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish has absolutely no data on how any trapped wildlife species populations are doing. And then finally, we look to try to debunk some common myths that are perpetuated by trappers associations and trappers themselves. Um, one of the big ones that they talk about is that this is the only way that some of their members can make a living is by trapping animals. Well, by doing a lot of research, um, I found that on average, the price of an animal pelt in the western U.S. is about $91. Now, this is taking into account ranging everything from $3 for a muskrat pelt to $300 for a bobcat pelt, and trapping bobcats is much more difficult. Um, and on average, a trapper only catches seven animals a year. So at best, you know, yeah, on average they're making less than $700 a year off of this. Some of the more, you know, ambitious trappers, I guess, could be making more, but the reality of it is nobody's making a living solely from trapping. Um, another common myth is that trapping helps prevent depredation of cattle and sheep, um, but according to documents that we were able to obtain from USDA, um, it's very clear that depred depredation is only a very small portion of overall livestock deaths, in some cases less than 1%. Um, and trapping is a very ineffective method of controlling that in the first place. There are many more non-lethal and much more effective methods to prevent depredation. All right, so uh, I had a really, really great experience this summer, um, and I learned a lot from my experience at Wild Earth Guardians, and so I'll just talk about a few of the things that I learned. Um, one of the really big take-home messages for me was the importance of being able to speak appropriately to a given audience, and this is especially true when giving public comment. Um, at the second Game Commission meeting, we were told we would have two minutes to speak, um, and this was when they had just opened the trapping rule, so I, I had prepared exactly what I was going to say. I had practiced it a bunch of times. It was down to a minute 58 every time. Show up. There were so many speakers there that halfway through, they decided, the rest of you only get one minute. So on the spot, I had to shorten my, my speech in half again while still actually maintaining what I was trying to say. And that's a very important skill to be able to have. Um, it's also really important to sound educated and knowledgeable about what you're talking about, as opposed to just sounding really emotional. Um, the commissioners were definitely much more likely to listen to people who sounded like they knew what they were talking about, who had something new to say, as opposed to people who were just screaming or crying at them. Um, it's also really important to be very con concise in both in terms of your time and the message that you're trying to get across. And it's also really important to try to get the right point across, which I know that a couple people had already mentioned it's important to choose the right words. And this, this can be a very nuanced thing, but it's very important. I also found that it's really important to learn how to speak to everyone, not just the people you agree with. Um, at one of our farmer's markets, we had a hunter come up, and he, at first, just kind of ignored my part of the table. He was very interested in our work on the Rio Grande and all of our river work, and 
that was great. And I kept trying to pull him into the conversation. And finally, he turned to me and he's like, you know, I just don't know how I feel about what you're doing because I'm a hunter. And I was like, well, okay, let's talk about that. And it's, it's true. It's all about finding common ground. As a hunter, okay, yeah, you're going out, you're searching for one animal. Hopefully, you are, you're tracking that one animal, you're going for the kill, and you're going for a quick kill. That is very different from trapping. Trapping, you don't know necessarily what you're going to catch. That animal can be sitting in that trap for up to 24 hours suffering. And so we ended up actually having a really great conversation, and we both took something away from it. All right, when I talk about the minutiae of it all, what I mean by that is that sometimes the world of animal advocacy can seem really big and overwhelming. But it's also really important to remember that we are all doing our own small part to make a difference. And the reverse of that is also true. Sometimes what we are doing can feel really small and insignificant, but we have to remember that each step forward is a step toward progress overall. Uh, the second one up here is definitely one of the biggest take-home messages for me. Um, combating burnout is really, really huge. Uh, there would be times when I would spend three days on end reading through trapping forums, reading stories about dogs caught in traps, and that could be really overwhelming, really depressing, and it really wears on you. And um, it would be on those times that my on-site mentor would come up to me and he'd be like, hey, take the afternoon off, take Friday off, let's plan a fun field trip for this week. And it's really important to remember to take that time for yourself, take those mental breaks, mix up your work, um, try to find just the joy in everything. And, um, and I think that this applies not only to animal advocacy, but to the veterinary profession and to all professions. It's really important to remember to take those mental breaks. Um, so it's really important to be able to cooperate with everyone. Um, this can be individuals, organizations, coalitions. Um, Wild Earth Guardians is, member, is a member of many different coalitions, and uh, I found it very interesting how each organization's mission really kind of impacts how they view different issues. And it's really important to be able to work with everyone in a way that still allows progress to be made. And then finally, with this last one, I found this to certainly be true for me, and especially in this political climate. You lose more than you win. But every battle is still really important because it brings to the forefront the importance of what every single one of us is doing. And with each victory, no matter how small, it helps pave the way for another. And even in the times when we don't win, at least we can hope that we're educating at least one person, and that can be a victory in and of itself. So what's next for me? Um, this past Wednesday, I actually just signed a contract with Wild Earth Guardians to finish um, the report that I spent the summer working on. So I will be continuing to work with their Santa Fe office at least through November. And then finally, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone, um, to Dr. Rupperg. Thank you so much. Um, you helped me secure this internship, and you provided me with uh, so much feedback and support all year long. Um, I want to say thank you to my on-site mentor, uh, Chris Smith. He really made my experience at Guardians a truly amazing one, um, as did everyone else in the Santa Fe Guardians office. Uh, I want to thank all of the MAP staff and, and faculty. I learned so much from each and every one of you. Uh, I definitely want to thank Jenny, because you provided assistance and a smiling face literally from day one. And I also want to thank my parents, um, especially my mom, because if it weren't for her, I would never have pursued this program in the first place. So, thank you, and any questions? <laughs> Well, I can say part of that would probably be culture. Um, I think it's a very, I mean, you get that Wild West mentality, but I think that's especially true in New Mexico. Um, you have a lot of people with the mindset that it's a, it's a heritage thing, it's a, a livelihood thing, and I think that has been one of the more pervasive things. And, I mean, obviously Massachusetts is an older state, but that being said, I think that perhaps not this year alone, but historically it has been a more progressive state and I think that that has probably had a lot to do with it and also just the urbanization I think we've we've urbanized Massachusetts to a point where 
it's not as common of a thing as it is still in New Mexico. I mean, New Mexico is one city of 500,000, and every other city in the state is under 100,000 people. And um, so you've got a lot more just open spaces and people who trap in general. So I think we are making progress. The last time that we introduced the bill, it made it further than it had in any previous iteration. And I think mindsets are slowly changing, but I think it's just going to take time. Of the coyote? Yeah, and you're, you're talking about the one of the coyote in the trap? Yep. Um, so it's that was found by one of our coalition members. Um, it's actually the now the logo for Trap for New Mexico. Um, but it's hard to say what specifically caused that damage. It could have been the trap itself. Um, different traps have different spring forces and can cause different amounts of damage, but it's also very possible that the coyote was chewing at his leg to try to remove it from the trap. So there's a lot of different ways for them to end up very injured once they're trapped. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know what the specific language of the bill is going to be. Um, we had just tried to pass them this fourth version um, earlier this year, and um, so the next one won't actually be introduced until 2021. Um, and it's, it's hard to say what they'll decide to do. It won't be a complete ban like California did. It'll be just on public lands. And chances are they'll try to model it off of what Arizona and Colorado have done, seeing as there are two neighboring states. And what they have done is prohibited all kill traps on public lands. So they still allow box traps, um, but they don't allow leg holds, snares, or conibear, which are the instant kill traps. So I imagine that it'll probably be something similar to that.